uh, yeah, I'll just start recording now. And then I'll ask uh, Ntanta if you may just please open for us in prayer. Okay, I'll open for us. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the renewed anointing upon Os Oscar on this day. Father God, may your Holy Spirit hover on us and may you open our hearts unto your wisdom in your word, Lord. May we get the revelation that you want us to get today. And may, Lord, may you give us the, the, the knowledge so that we can go into the world, Lord, and proclaim your gospel and truth. In Yeshua's name, amen. But I've been speaking alone throughout. I didn't notice that I muted everything. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I'm just going to share now the screen. Um, if this thing will allow me. Uh, we have to share the program. Uh, let me know if you can see it. Do you guys see? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, guys, yes. today we're going to be, a, 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 as well, we're going to be a, a, a bit more also uh, interactive. Uh, if may just allow me, I forgot to close the door here. I'll just close the door for a second. All right, today we're doing the book of numbers. Uh, we've been chilling a lot in Mount Sinai now. We, it's about time we get into some drama. We had a lot of law last week, uh, which has caused a lot. Uh, and if you remember, we, we have dealt with all of those books so far, uh, up to Leviticus last week. And today we are uh, dealing with uh, Exodus. Um, okay, and it is the fourth book of the Torah. Uh, do you guys remember what the Torah is? The Torah has got, well, what is the Torah? Uh, Michelle, what is the Torah? Mm, I haven't heard you explaining on the Torah, but what I know about it is the Judaism Bible, so to say, it's the, the book the Jews use. Nope. Uh, anybody was here on the first lecture? Uh -huh, people are just scared to, to come out because of time. Again, the Torah is the first five books. Uh, the whole Old Testament, so called Old Testament, we decided we, we discussed it on the first lecture. It's actually uh, all these first books before, before Matthew and, and Mark, they are actually uh, the scriptures of the Jews and it's called the Tanakh. Oscar, uh, good question. So we call it the Torah as well? So yeah. So we call the first book the Torah. It doesn't yeah, matter the, first, the, the, the first five books, they are called uh, the books of the law. Do you see here down here in, in, in green, it says yeah. Torah slash the law. So the group, okay, yeah, so in the first classes, we group them. So we, I told you which groups, which, which group is history, which groups is prophets, and which one is writing. So we're starting with the Torah. So we're going to add all these other books. So you're going to see history books and other books. But the first five 
They are called the Torah. They are books of the law. And they were written by Moses. Uh, so I'm just going to say that so that we may pass. Uh, yeah. And guys, you know, the Bible, it's, please always have this thing in your mind. The Bible, it's always, it's all about God establishing his kingdom on earth. I'm not going to go into the whole history that we have already covered, but God has been trying to establish uh, his kingdom here on earth. And um, there's been many disappointments uh, and failures all the way from Eden. So we have had everything that in the Bible taking place in this small area as well, uh, which, you know, at, we know life began in Africa, but now this small area, it's now called, for some reason, the Middle East. But in the ancient world, it was, it was just one world. So everything is taking place in that tiny uh, region. Uh, we've learned how Abraham, how Abraham was chosen and uh, God made a covenant with him. And later, God chose Moses to save the Israelites uh, from down here uh, in Egypt under the Antichrist of the Egyptians. And he is the savior, uh, just like Jesus. So he's taking them into the promised land, which was promised to Abraham. But again, from here in Egypt, from Ramses going to, a to Canaan, it's a simple way there. But for some reason, these people are going to take this route uh, down there, the other direction. But then again, you have to tell me why. Why aren't they going that way? Why are they taking the long route? Yeah, I remember this one. But two, a Galaxy Smart Tag, Samsung Care Plus, and one year screen protection worth 5,200 dollars. Oh, so somebody, somebody's got this. Let's go. Where you go, MTN. Okay, someone has got the Hi. TV on. I'm just going to take care of Okay, thank you. Yeah, so so guys, yeah, why are they not taking the, the short route to, to Canaan? We have to be quick today. It's because they, they, they weren't ready for war. Yes, because that way is the way of the Philistines and they were not ready for war. So we learned from, um, we learned from, uh, we learned from Exodus 12 that they took uh, they started moving from Egypt in Ramses, and then they traveled all the way to Sakot. Uh, and then we learned from Exodus 15 that they traveled to, to Elam and then all the way to, Re, uh, to Repidim in chapter 17. And we ended up uh, in the last, from chapter 20 to uh, 14 of Exodus, they arrived at Mount Sinai and that's where they received the 10 commandments and they camped uh, at the wilderness down there in Sinai. So now when Leviticus started, it started while they were still camping at the wilderness of Mount Sinai. So we did the whole book. So the, for the whole month they were there. So it took them two years from uh, Ramses to this time now when we are uh, uh, on the book of Numbers. So when we start the book of Numbers, we realize that it actually took them two years. So now the journey is starting to begin now. God, um, uh, you know what, we are going to take this journey from Mount Sinai, but first remember, what did I say the Bible is all about? I just told you now. God that, establishing, establishing his kingdom. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So it's about God establishing his kingdom here on earth. Right? That, that part is also very important. It's already established in heaven. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, um, you know, let your will be done here on earth as it is in, 
it's done in heaven. In heaven, it's done, but here on earth, unfortunately, it's not. So this is what the Bible is all about. And at the end, in Revelation, we realize that it's going to be. So by, for now, we are dealing with all the problems that we're getting to try and get God's kingdom here on earth. So, but then what do you need um, in order to establish a kingdom? When you're saying this is a kingdom, what is the basics? What must be there for something to be a kingdom? A king. Mm -hmm. Correct. Asbu. Uh, and rule. Uh, and what? Rules or rules or, or laws. laws. Very, very good. And what else? What about subjects, people, followers? Yeah, uh, very, very good, guys. I'm, I'm very excited. Um, and what else? There's one more thing. There must be a place where this kingdom must exist. Ah, very good. Ah, guys, thank you. You made my life easier. You are right. We've, we've got a king. Remember in, in Exodus, God, God comes in and lives in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. So God came down. And now we've got the citizens and the citizens are the ones that have been taken from the slavery of the Egyptians. And these are the Israelites, the 12 tribes. And we've got the laws, the rules, or what we call the legislation. So what is missing? From the list you gave me. <laughs> you just told me now the, the, the yeah, place where these people place, live. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, remember these are not uh, tricky questions. Eh? Uh, yeah, so you, you, you'll notice, guys, you, once you capture this, you're going to see this is the plan. And you're going to see even at the end in Revelation, because this is God's plan from the beginning. You saw him in Aden, he used to come down here, you know, and until things were messed up. Now he's trying to do this thing through Moses, but it's going to be a mess. But at the end, when the Messiah returns, he's going to establish that kingdom. And at the end, God is going to relocate here on earth, you know, and establish and become the king. And Jesus will take the, the, the crown off and he give it to the father and the father will be here. So this has always been... Um, the goal and this is what our goal is to enter that kingdom of god so these guys they are actually a, a, a shadow picture of 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 that because history repeats itself the bible is a history box so you're going to see these things sort of things repeating themselves uh or types of shadows coming through so now uh these people are chosen by god remember now they're supposed to be different from other people you know uh, so God chose these people because he's holy he's supposed to set these people apart and we said um, you know uh, 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 that means they need to be holy so this is why they're given the laws for them to be holy just as God is holy so you know what in numbers we are marching to this place that is missing the territory is that the correct spelling of territory it doesn't look right. So forgive me if that, that is a, uh, a wrong uh, spelling. Uh, so we've, in order for us, so we, we, which is that place then? Which is that place where the kingdom is going to be? Hello? Hello? Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is a city uh, and, and quite a good city. And it's true because that's where, remember, even, even in a territory, there has to be a place where the, where the Lord lives. So, you know, so that's where the king is going to stay. But for now, let's just say the territory, it's Canaan. That's where these people are going. That's what these numbers, it's all about showing us now. They're moving from Syria from Sinai and they're going to 
the book uh, to, to the land, to the promised land. So now again, I've told you too many times that, uh, you know, obviously uh, numbers, it's not the actual uh, title of the book. The actual title of the book, it's in the desert. Where do you think these words come from? Where did they, where did they get this title? How do we get the, the proper title from, uh, from the Jewish books? First words, first words yes. of the yes. book. Yes, so, so in the desert is the name of the book. Numbers, you know what, again, numbers came with the Greeks many, many years later after Babylon. Uh, and they say it's because there's numbering of people and whatever. I think it's, it's not a very good title again. But it's not a too bad title, you know, because there is numbering of people. But that's not, it's, it's very misleading because it gives you an idea. That's what the book is all about. But it's not really about that. But there is counting of men uh, from the first chapter uh, because God is counting, trying to find out. Now that we are moving to the promised land, you must be ready to fight now. You know, we didn't take it through the land of the uh, Philistine. Now we are going there and we're going to meet all these funny people. Now you must be ready to fight. So let's count all the men that can fight all the men, I think over the age of 20, you know, who can fight from each tribe. And also God, what God does, he also arranged them uh, how he's going, how they're going to camp. You know, uh, so his God is, um, God lives in a, in a tabernacle, in the tent, uh, and then everybody else has to camp around uh, the tabernacle. So he gives the order in chapter one, and then he numbers the, the people, after he numbers the people. So he gives the order how the tribes will be arranged around. Uh, and most importantly, we are going to learn also about um, the placement of the Levites as well, you know, uh, how they should be around the tabernacle. I'll just show you the picture now. Uh, and also their numbers, and then they are also uh, set apart, you know, and they're anointed to be God's special people than the other tribes uh, to be priests for God. And, um, uh, so, oh God, oh yes, oh, I thought I didn't have that one. So now you will see here, this is how they camp. So this is, this is uh, the inner tent and right in the beginning you'll have the holies and then there's a curtain that patterns there and that side you'll have the holy of holies. Uh, with the Ark of the Covenant, and this is where God stays, and then there will, there will be smoke that comes out from uh, God's Holy of Holies. So the priests, they are allowed to come in here, and they stay here, but first it is Moses and Aaron right in front of the gate. So Moses' tent and Aaron's tent, they will stay there, and then after Moses, there is priests, uh, and after and around here, there's Levites. Who are the priests, by the way? Uh, just guess. Aaron and his sons. Yes, thank you very much. So these are the sons of Aaron. They are also Levites, by the way, but you know we've read about them in, Le in Leviticus. So these are special because they are sons of, of Aaron. But every other Levites, they are set apart to be priests and they stay over them. And then you've got all, I mean, from the older guy here, Simeon, Rumen, Ged, you know, so you've got all of these other tribes around far from, from the tent, uh, which will play a very important role just now. And just to mention only Judah as well. Judah is there uh, just after the priests, you know, on the entrance. And it is important that Judah is also there. It's a special tribe. You know, um, so, uh, you know, I did not get a chance to write the numbers of the men that were counted there, but because there's a book of numbers and, you know, 
people think i mean the, it must the numbers are they, they were important as well so sorry guys i didn't get to put all the numbers but there's go odd odd as you can see in god's kingdom we don't just say ah we are all god's children uh we are all equal yes we are all equal but god has anointed some other people for specific jobs and what what not you know so this order so we are going to see what happens throughout in in, in fact this book it should have just been named that because throughout you're going to find dramas of people trying to mess up with the order and and god dealing with them so um you know so i've 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 already uh why do you think Judah and it's, it's, it's placed here? It's not written in the Bible though, but just for us, just what do you think? Why do you think these guys and everyone, they're placed like this? Just guys here, guys. I think Jesus from the tribe of Judah. So what does Jesus got to do with this? Hi, Oscar. Hi, yes. I, I'm not sure if it's correct, but um, uh, one of the uh, prophecies of uh, Jacob when he was about to die, he said the scepter will come from there. I don't know if that is the, the correct answer. When yeah, he was blessing you, it, his sons. It, it is. You're, I thought you were just going to connect it with what um, Maureen just said now. You know? I was asking her and I wanted her to give exactly what you said. So you guys, you're, you're giving me pieces, you know? Yes, because remember, this is leadership. You look at here, it's leadership. And yes, like you said, Jesus is coming from the tribe of Judah. Uh, and remember, these people are not supposed to have kings, you know? So the God, God again, is gonna come and rule. Jesus, remember, is the Messiah, he's a king. He's supposed to come here and rule as a king. You're going to see it in Revelation. When Jesus comes, you know, he's going to come and rule as a king. He hasn't done the job yet, guys. He has done maybe a quarter of a job by coming to die on the cross. But the main job is for him to come and be a king in the kingdom. And a lot of people, they miss, they miss this, <laughs> this thing. And the gospel is about the kingdom. Once you don't put kingdom, whatever you're... Sorry, guys. Um, I switched on my phone because I'm using the data from the phone. So... Uh, let me, let me put this phone on silence if I can, and it's, it's refusing. Yeah. Yeah. So remember, and, and another important thing about Jesus, you know, is that he's going to replace all of these people. You know, he's going to replace most, <laughs> most of the stuff that is here. Uh, Smangele, yeah, please don't forget to pose. So if Jesus is going to replace... He's going to be, I mean, Moses is already, uh, you know, it is the prophet, uh, but he's also, you know, in that leadership, like, like Judah is supposed to, but no man is supposed to be king. So he is a prophet and this one is a priest. Uh, it's a high priest. So Jesus is going to be both of these things. He's going to be the king. So this part here, you know, is just uh, very important because it's, like you said, it's, it's, it's also representing Jesus. Uh, but I, again, I think while we're still here, uh, uh, I've got a question because I see that we've got, if you count these tribes here, they're actually not 12. Don't we have 12 tribes? Okay, how many tribes do we have, guys? Maybe I should ask it like that. How many tribes of of Israelites. Mm, Israelites. 12. Uh, where do we get that 12 from? The sons of Jacob. Yes. So the sons of Jacob, they are 12. But we've got a problem there uh, because we've got 13. Why do we have 13? If you count here, it's 13, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, 12, 13. So why do we uh, have 13? John, no, except for John. Except okay. for John. 
<laughs> okay, I want okay. everybody else to. Except for John. Why do we have 13? Uh, Manasseh is Manasseh is not uh, Jacob's son. Okay. <laughs> so 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 Manasseh is added. Are, are yeah. all these people that are here Jacob's sons? Uh -uh. Okay, let me take even you to let me take you to friend. yeah. So so who is missing from um Jacob's sons? Hey, let's see who's missing. Joseph, let me. Yes, Joseph is missing. So Joseph is replaced by Can I answer. <laughs> Joseph, Joseph is replaced by Ephraim and Manasseh. You see? So this is basically one tribe. This is Joseph. So these are the sons of, of, of Joseph. Because Joseph went to Egypt and he had these two sons. And when they came in, they joined, um, yeah, they, came, they, they joined their brothers. But uh, so this is actually one. So it's, that's why we've got 13 instances of 12, because these two years, they count as one. So yeah, so that's why Ephraim and Manasseh, they are one. They are Joseph, they, are, they represent one Joseph. So uh, uh, what, did I, what else did I want to ask? Oh, yes. And now we are coming into the, an exciting part. You know, uh, the Levites were exempted from, they were not counted with all these other tribes when they were counting the numbers of people uh, who are ready to go to war because the Levites will not go to war, but the Levites are set apart and they are placed there for an interesting job. Um, and uh, what do you think, uh, and, and all these tribes, they were not, they were far away, but these ones are here. What do you think is the function of the Levites? Everyone can, anyone can give. I think they work in the tabernacle or what? Okay, it's true. They, they work in the tabernacle to do what? They were collecting the tithe. Yeah, and remember, yeah. So yeah, they'll be doing all of this work Tithes and also remember that the tithe is not like the main thing. Uh, tithe is just food for them because they don't work, they don't do all these other things. They are God's special people. You see, there is hierarchy. You know, everyone is God's people, but yeah, but God has chosen these ones to be his own special sons. And then he's even chosen Moses and Aaron and then their sons to even be even more close. You know, so. Uh, but yes, that is their job. But they've got a very interesting job that I've never. It blew me away when I, when I realized what what it is. Uh, so we, I'm just gonna allow you guys to to read it. Uh, you know, their job was actually to take up the tabernacle, you know, and to pitch it up. So they you remember now they are, they are ready to move to to the promised land. So they're gonna to have to move. They're gonna to have to carry all of these tent and things for God. So their job is to carry all of these things, you know, to pitch the tent and to, nobody else is supposed to touch this thing, <laughs> you know, uh, for a very important reason. But what do you think, what else do you think it's their job? I just, I just, I just gave you a clue and I said, nobody else is supposed to touch these things. Only Levites because they are consecrated to do this job. So what do you think they are kept there for? The intermediaries, I think. No. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I just told you when, when, when I'm giving you a clue that Nobody else is supposed to touch this tent except these guys, the Levites. Except, and these guys, they are kept away. Isn't it? Yeah. Isn't yes. it to of sacrifices? Yes, it is because nobody else can can uh, can offer sacrifices. 
Okay, besides pitching the tent, you see, you see now I was trying to let you think of now we are moving, we are, we are going there and we're talking about the tent, nobody can touch it and whatever, but let me just give it to you because I also did not know it, but <laughs> it is a very interesting function. The job of the Levites was to guard the temple. I mean, the tabernacle. Okay, it's going to be the temple in the future, sorry. It was to guard this tabernacle. Nobody is supposed to come to guard it against who? I just told you. To guard it against who? Against the other, against the other uh, tribes. Yes, the, against it. Yes. Yes, against all these tribes, nobody's supposed to come in here, you know, and uh, and then an interesting thing is, you know, we are all God's children, but these guys here, that's why I said they cannot, only the Levites can touch uh, the tent. Nobody else can come close, so they're supposed to stay far, only the Levites. So now you're going to appreciate, actually, when you get into the New Testament, let me spoil a little you know, uh, that, you know, when, when you are being told that you are a priest, you are a royal priesthood, not on, on top of that, now you will understand where you are being placed, you know. So God is holy, guys. Not everyone, even his children, you can't just get close to him, you know. So you, so you, you are going to see, I mean, we've seen it in Exodus, we've seen it in, in, um, uh, in Leviticus, there's too much, there's too much of consecration each time for them to, to be kept there. You know what, they, they have to sacrifice, keep doing this in order to, to keep being specially holy for, for them to be there. But you know what the interesting thing is? It's not just to guard, you know? It's, it's so now it was to guard these guys or uh, not to come there. So in other words, it means this guy's job is to, listen to this guy, is to guard God. Do you get that? They are guarding God against these people. You know, it's a two-way thing, although they are also guarding these people against God. Because if these people get there, the Levites are being told to kill them. So their job is to kill anyone that comes close them, you know. So even if they get missed and then, you know, somebody gets the God is going to kill them in any way, you know. So only Levites can be there, but their job is to guard God and to make sure nobody gets close to God. You know, uh, now when I, when I was reading this, you know, I actually had a thought, you know, this was my personal thought. And I was thinking about Jesus when, when, when he had um, the 12 uh, uh, disciples, you know. Uh, now, when you, when, when you read the scriptures there, you realize that, you know, they used to guard him, you know. And I know we, when you come from hyper grace, you know, we're thinking everyone had access to Jesus and whatever. You'll realize that, no, somewhere you'll say, no, let the children come because they're stopping. It's their job. Who? How did, how did they know that they need to stop people? They need to do all of that, that stuff. It's because it was their job. God made them do that. Nobody was just supposed to have access to Jesus. Even when the woman touched him, you know, she, she, I don't know, she did a trick underneath the unseen, and then she touched him, and it's like, who touched me? You know, because nobody's just supposed to come close to God, you know, and the special people that God has placed them around because God is holy, guys. You know, so I just had that idea to say, you see, not everyone is just supposed to have access to Jesus. You know, even now I'm thinking of that uh, woman, that woman um, who was a Gentile. You remember Gentiles, it just represents sinners. Anybody that is not consecrated, that is not one of the 12 tribes, uh, it's, it's sinners. So, you know, Jesus, when Jesus was asking, when she was asking for healing and he says, must I take the food for the children? and give to the dogs, you know, this God's special people and everyone else that is not consecrated, uh, it's a dog, you know. So, so this is where you are, when you, by the time when you get to the New Testament, you realize how special uh, you have been made when, you are, when you've got access to God, 
when you when the Holy Spirit lives in you, when you when the Father is in you and you are in Him, you know, it's way too deep. But without this, you can't really get it. Now we're gonna have to move a bit um, fast because I don't see or oh, this the time there. So now uh, we've got. Um, no, there was there was a question I wanted to ask. Oh no, I've already given you the answer. You know, so we're going to move. Uh, you know, and and maybe maybe when we're still there, guys. Uh, do you see this scripture on the screen? Do you see this scripture on the screen? Hello. Yes, yes, we see it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, guys, please, uh, you, please, let's interact. So their job, I told you, if anybody tries to get an outsider, they're not meaning uh, non-Jews, they mean non-Levites, you know. If anybody tries to come through, the Levites' job was to kill them, you know, and it's, it's going to mess up your mind a bit, you know, but I'll let, I'll let that sink in for you. And later in Samuel, we're actually good. And all those chapters and things, it's repeated too many times. They are told this law throughout the book, you know, in chapter three, in twice, in 16, and in 28. So their job is actually to kill um, uh, the other children of God who come <laughs> close to God. It's quite interesting. In Samuel, you know, uh, remember, we learned about um, when uh, we learn about uh, 70 Philistines. Remember that the Ark of Covenant in the future is going to be taken by the Philistines. Uh, and then they will be trying to return it, doing a good thing. But the problem is that they're going to touch it and God is going to strike them because, you know, you can't just touch it. You know, only the Levites can touch the Ark. Only the Levites can get in close there. Uh, and guys, you know, something that when I was reading this as well, because us as Christians, especially us from hyper grace, we don't understand the holiness of God. We are being told that we are God's friend. I'm a friend of God who <laughs> used to sing that song. You know, we are making God to be too easy and too. Remember what we said about holiness. Holiness is to make something uh, uncommon. You know, uh, it's not access to every, it's not like common use for everybody. So, but you know, at these days, churches, they've made God to be so simple and so easy. It's all about love and what he accepts everything and sinners and what, what, and all of that, you know, in such a way that God is no longer referenced uh, as holy, as something separate, as something, you know, uh, great. So now in the, in the New Testament, we even see, in the church of Corinth, which is like uh, the first charismatic church that I knew, that I know, uh, they, they, they actually had all of these spiritual gifts, but they were like spiritual babies, typical charismatic church, you know. So now um, what they were doing, you know, I remember the whole thing, they were drinking even the holy communion. They were partaking the holy communion in an unworthy manner. You know, because they're taking things casually. They will even come and drink and get drunk and do all that stuff with the Holy Communion. You know, so that's how, you know, the, the best way that I've heard another man explaining holiness, he said, casual, you know, is to take God's things casually. You know, I've already given you even some of the things that I repented from when I, when I, when I learned uh, actually from the book of Levites. And uh, another thing that I actually changed from, uh, you know, at, it's praying, you know, and now, <laughs> ever since I understood holiness, and now, guys, you know, uh, as I'm confessing, I used to do these prayers where you're just lying in bed at night, you just know that, okay, I need to pray before I sleep, and you are lying there, you are naked inside the, <laughs> the blankets, and you're just whispering or whatever until you fall asleep, you know, that's not taking... God's thing. That's not understanding how holy God is. God is king, you know. 
He needs to be reverenced. You need to give God the glory that he, he deserves. He, you know, he's not your equal. He's not your, your man. So hyper grace made it think like God is just some, you know, no guys, you know, God is holy. So you need to respect him as king. So now all my prayers, I need, I, I kneel down. I reverence God as, as holy and I pray to him as king, you know, so, you know, no longer all those funny casual things. So, uh, yeah. So now uh, the Levites are chosen in, in the first chapters, you know, so this is something that you would have expected in Leviticus, but Leviticus was about the sons. Some of the chapters were about the sons of Aaron or the priests, but here the Levites are actually now set apart uh, for God's uh, special job. Uh, and now because firstborns, guys, they're supposed to be consecrated for God. All firstborns are supposed to be holy and they belong to God, but God actually chose uh, instead of firstborns from all the tribes, he actually just took the Levites as the firstborns, you know, to be special and to be his own people. So now uh, let's just break down the book a little bit uh, and then we'll get into the stories. So again, <laughs> like I said, you are going to hear this over and over. Holiness, it's throughout, you know, so uh, there's even a test for purity. Now, I, I, this story actually interested me in chapter five. Uh, you know, before they continued camping. So they're going to actually to, to stay in Mount Sinai, been given all these laws from chapter one to chapter 10. And from 11, then they pick up the, the tabernacle and they start marching. So they are still being given some few laws. Uh, so in chapter five, they have been given laws about purity or holiness in a marriage. And you know what, um, there's quite an interesting uh, story there. Uh, do I have time to tell you about it? Okay, let me just let me just quickly tell you. So if a man uh, feels jealous for his wife and he's thinking she's cheating, uh, and you know, there is actually a test to test whether uh, this person is, is committing adultery, you know. So the man can take that wife to the priest uh, and then they had a test in which, you know, they make a vow. And if that woman is committing adultery, she'll, she'll, she'll speak curses upon herself, upon her womb and everything. And if, uh, if, if she did, if she did not do it, then those things will not happen. So it was a very <laughs> funny thing that I'm reading. I'm like, hey, what is this? <laughs> this is very uh, scary to our culture. Uh, but yeah, uh, again, there's laws that if anybody does not um, does not uh, obey these laws not just these purity laws, no, not just this, this one of jealousy, all the laws that have been given the, uh, and the laws of Sabbath and all, everything and all these sacrifices that they need to do, all these laws that they've been given. If somebody does not do that, now this is important, guys. They need to be kicked out of the camp. They are, they're, they're kicked out as they're no longer Jews. They've been kicked out. And this year, guys, this year, you know, it's something, it's something that continues even throughout into the New Testament. You know, that if somebody does not want, does not live a holy life in the church, they are supposed to be kicked out, you know. I also didn't want to waste time going to all of those things. But one of the uh, famous ones, you know, is the one of the men in, 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 in the church of Corinth, you know, committing very funny sexual uh, sins there and he was not repenting. So... There's actually processes before you kick someone out. You can't just kick someone out out of the church uh, the first time, you know. Uh, but when that person does not depend, you need to kick them out of the church. Uh, they call it excommunication from the Latin, from the uh, from the Catholic Church. But you know, I'll accept that term. Um, so Paul actually said, you know, kick kick this person to to Satan, so that Satan can deal with their with their flesh. You know, so so there is that thing which now in our churches, 
our churches are too apostate and we've got this hyper grace thing going on. So people can just do whatever, they can just do anything, and there's no longer excommunication, there's no longer holiness, God's God's church is no longer reverent. Do you see how in the news everybody's speaking so badly about churches and all the filthiness that is happening? Women are being raped, monies are being uh, this money, funny financial, you know, it's 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 a mess. Witchcraft, even in church. It's no longer that holy thing. And God, God being a holy, he said to the he choosing the, the Jewish people that they are supposed to be holy, to, to represent his glory to the other people. I'm going to ask you this question because later it's going to play a very, very important role in one of the dramatic stories. So, you know, now the church, again, we've been told this too many times, you know, God cares about his glory. You know his his image. You will hear this thing when we when we are reading throughout the scriptures. The name of the Lord. You know how people perceive him. How people and us we're supposed to be a reflection of him into the world. Now, if we just do all these funny things, God would rather not have that church. You know because his name matters more. We he's more important than than us. So so such people who are defiling God's God's name and image, they need to be destroyed. You know, they need to be kicked out, you know. So now we get to chapter six and people can make vows to be uh, Nazarites. You know what, uh, you know what, you just consecrate yourself for the purpose of, of, of God to be used by God. You know, you don't drink alcohol, you don't sleep around. Some choose not even to marry, you know just for you to be used by God. And it's a practice that also continues even in the New Testament, you know, um, something that you can choose. And I remember even Paul talked to um, about even the married people, if you want to go and pray and consecrate yourself for prayer, you know, you can fast and you can withdraw from sexual intimacy just for prayer, but hey, quickly go back before Satan comes in. So, you know, if you want to be a Nazarite and you've got that thing, hey, you can, you you can do that, but yeah, most of us, <laughs> you know, I'd say she were better, we better off, um, you know, at married and things, you know. Uh, and again, in that very same chapter six, you'll see Aaron um, uh, speaking a blessing to the people. Oh, guys, you know, this is this is where I see God's grace. You know, these people who don't even deserve anything, God is speaking a blessing upon them. And, you know, and it's, it's prosperity, guys. You know, this is why there is a place for prosperity gospel, you know. Uh, it's just not in the way these uh, funny people are doing it. But guys, never kick uh, prosperity out of the gospel. It is part of the the gospel god wants to bless us and remember we are, we are the representative of him to the people you know so we need to have his glory we need to but it shouldn't be um uh, through external but uh things but the externals they also matter just like holiness matter and it's it's an outside thing and then chapter seven um everything that that is to be used in the tabernacle and to carry it, to move it, to uh, as they are departing to the promised land, it has to be consecrated. So it is dedicated in chapter seven. And then in, um, uh, again, in chapter uh, eight, you know, at, there's also this setting up of the lambs and the separation of Levites. I told you that this is gonna keep coming back again. These people, they keep need to be, the, the Levites, they keep need, needing to be cleansed and to be done all these things, but they are working in a very important place. This is why guys, when you go to the book of Hebrews, you realize that how much it really takes for God to keep you. You know, you and I so are supposed to be doing these things that the Levites and these people are doing every time this, sacrifices, cleansing, what, what it's costing all the time. And Jesus did this thing for us. So that's how much you're supposed to be appreciating Jesus and, 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 and live uh, rightly before him, you know? Uh, and one important one, it's the observance of Passover. You know, they keep repeating it from Exodus to Leviticus, Passover. And, and by the way, it was two years 
after they have uh, left uh, Egypt. So they had to go through Passover, uh, which is Pasek. But then <laughs> I think, yeah, in, in this chapter nine, there's a guy who did not actually, was not observing uh, a, a Passover because he was caught uh, uh, taking sticks, carrying sticks and picking up sticks. And they was taken to Moses, you know, uh, and the priests there, and that uh, this man was caught carrying um, things. And God says, hey, kill him. Let everybody stone him. Everybody put him <laughs> in the public and let everybody from all tribes come and stone him. And, you know, he was stoned to death. Uh, and, you know, this is how important uh, God's laws are supposed to be taken. Don't take things uh, casually. And those who, are, who think they can observe uh, Passover and all these Seventh-day Adventists, they don't even know how much restricting it is. This guy is just picking up sticks. You know, there's many things. The Jews, they even argue with things. Uh, I've even done one, I think, uh, a case long time ago in some legal studies about a Jew who who's taken to uh to uh to court because he let his electricity something fall down and it damaged somebody but he said look it was sad but i couldn't fix it i can't do anything you know <laughs> so there's all these funny things to say hey can i answer the phone on sabbath or that will be considered work because i'm picking up this thing you know, so Sabbath is something that, yo, know, it was very difficult. It's hard to do anything. So you find people are saying they're, <laughs> they're observing Sabbath, but they are busy doing all these funny things, other things. They just think it's Sabbath means to go to church and pray. No. Yeah, but yeah, God was setting up to say, look, there's no, uh, there's no compromise when it comes to, uh, to holiness. So the Levites from the ages of 25 to 49, there was uh they were to work in the in, in the tabernacle, but they must retire at 50, you know. Um so now uh in after this man was kicked out, God's cloud came down uh during the day and at night um at night, at night around the tabernacle, then there would be fire, just like that one there. So fire at night or clouds during the day or vice versa. I can't, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm putting this right, but that's how God was representing himself around the camping area. Uh, so, you know, and I like it, uh, guys, the, I said that God is a consuming fire before. And I said, is what is this in reference of when we say God is a consuming fire? Does anybody remember? Uh, John? I drew a blank. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> okay, maybe it will it will it will come as we go. Mulemba, you don't remember it as well. Nah, I don't. <laughs> oh, all right. No, it will click as we continue. So now they start journeying from chapter eleven. Now, what was there in yeah from chapter eleven? They start journeying now. Uh, it's time to go to move from Sinai. So they are actually going to go all the way there to Kadesh. But there's dramas waiting in all these other funny places in Kibroth and Hazaroth, and even in Kadesh, there's a whole lot of drama. These books were just supposed to be called dramas, to be honest. You know, so uh, they start in chapter 11, uh, they start complaining about how hard things are, you know, and this is when God came to burn them with fire. Now, do you remember? 
consuming fire. You know, this is not told in terms of the sinners, you know, the context is usually in terms of the believers warning you guys, you know, to say, don't play around with God. God is a consuming fire. And here he's consuming his own children. So, you know, you know, we must respect God's things. We must do things in order, you know. So now Moses prayed and the fire stopped, you know, because it was grilling everybody, you know. But then they continued again complaining still in the very same chapter. They complain about the manna and they say, hey, we are tired of eating this thing. What is this thing? We want meat and we used to eat meat then. And you know what, uh, you know, even Moses was like, hey, you know what, I'm tired of carrying these people around with this complaining of theirs. God, please, why? Why are you doing this to, this thing to me? Why do why, why you, why you want me to bless these people like I'm their man? And then God actually uh, gave him 70 elders uh, to lead with him so that he, they, uh, they help him with the load. But you know what? Because they complained about uh, the manum and they wanted the meat, God decided he's going to deal with them. And he sent quails, many quails. And while they were eating that, those quails, he sent a plague. A plague. You remember, you know, God and his plagues. Again, he is the one who's sending plagues like Corona or, or AIDS or whatever, you know, to kill these people because of their own wickedness. Again, like I said, people, we, they always think diseases and things they're coming from demons and whatever, or the devil. You're going to say throughout the Bible, most of them, it's, it's God, you know, it's, it's hardly uh, the devil. So now, you know, uh, in chapter 12, then there's another drama now, the next chapter. Aaron and Miriam, they start criticizing Moses. And remember, Aaron and, and, and Miriam, they are Moses' older brother and sister, you know. So they, and Miriam is like, you know, at, uh, I'm a prophetess and God speaks through us. And it's true, God speaks through these people, you know. And who's this Moses? Why, why does he marry a Kushite woman? So they act like, you know, what, it's all about the Kushite woman. But you know what, they're actually... Uh, disrespecting his position. Hey, even God can speak to us. Hey, who do you think you are? When I'm Moses. <laughs> and Moses, is wrote, he wrote this thing. It is the writer of this book. So he writes about this. He said, no, Moses was the meekest man on the planet. And what actually it means that, you know, what, he wouldn't defend himself to these people, try to say, okay, I know I'm the God's chosen one. Who do you think? You know what? You know what? He just, he just left them. But God says, hey, you three, come here. Come here at the tabernacle, you know. And then <laughs> he tells them, he tells these two, uh, Miriam and Aaron, he says, hey, listen, all the other prophets, if, if there's a prophet, I speak to them through visions and through uh, 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 dreams. But Moses, I speak to him uh, face to face. You know, I speak to him like this. You should have been, don't you fear that? Shouldn't you be afraid of that? You know? Then what does it do? He sends smoke from the tabernacle where God is staying. And then he hits Miriam again with the, with the plague of leprosy. She became white like snow. Then Aaron repented. And he prayed to Moses. And when he's praying to Moses, you know, even calling master, oh, we've done wrong, hey, what, what, what. And then God, I mean, Moses interceded for them to, to God and God did not punish uh, Aaron. So we move on to the next chapter again, another drama. Another drama starts. Hey, guys, my pictures are not showing him. Uh, but the is the story of the 12 spies. You know, they are sent uh, to go and spy the land, the promised land in Canaan. You know, after a month, they come back 
you know, they are, and they are now already in Kadesh in the desert of, of Paran. So now uh, 12 spies were taken from each, each tribe. So all of these guys, they come back and they report, yo, Canaan is actually a nice place. It's a land of milk and honey. But hey, we cannot enter there because there's hey, it's fortified and there's there's the Nephilims, you know. Do you remember what the Nephilims are? Oh, uh, Maureen. No, I forgot. <laughs> oh, Michelle. Oh, no. What is a Nephilim? Uh, Mr. Ankuna? Clive? Didn't uh, the, the giants yes. who, who were born when the angels um, slept with the women? Yes. So they were the hybrid children of the angels when they slept with the women there back there in Genesis, uh, is it 11 or 10? Yeah, somewhere there. So I thought they went, they were, they, they were killed by the flood, you know, because that was before Noah. I thought only Noah survived. So who are these people saying why, you know, are they lying, you know, or they're just seeing people who are just big and they're just saying, ah, these are Nephilims because they've heard stories about <laughs> the Nephilims. They actually don't even know what Nephilims look like. But anyway, uh, yes, they were big people. Uh, one of them actually we're going to learn about uh, a Philistine uh, when David is going to actually defeat him. But I don't think he was a Nephilim. I don't think he was a giant because they actually give his his uh, dimensions, how tall he is. And you, you know what? It's just a normal height of this uh, gigantic people. But Nephilim were quite huge. Um, but however, there was only one guy, Caleb, from the tribe of Judah who was courageous. And God was very impressed with him. He said, no, let us go now. Let us go and get this land. We can come into this land. But the people started complaining because they had those other guys that don't want to hear Caleb. They started complaining, oh my God, oh, we are going to die. Oh, you know. But then Joshua and Caleb came and then Joshua, they stripped off the clothes. They said, no, man, guys, please, man. So they tried to encourage the people that, no, man, guys, we can do it. Then the people tried to stone them. They want to kill them. They want to hear the, you know. So, you know, God, and the Bible actually calls that faith. You know, those ones, they were faithless, but, you know, uh, Joshua and Caleb, had faith. So now uh, God was angry with them. Again, he decides, you know what? No, I'm going to wipe all of these people, all of them. I'm going to wipe them. I'm just going to leave you, Moses. You know what? I'm going to start maybe a new, a new uh, a nation through you. I can't, I can't deal with these people. And you know what? Now this very impre impressed me so much. Moses interceded for these people. And I like the way he prayed for these people. He played on God's ego, you know, saying, ah, Lord, how will these other nations think? I mean, you've, you've delivered these people from Canaan there, and now, you know, you, you kill them here. People are gonna think, hey, look, uh, that Lord failed. He failed to deliver them into the land that he promised them. You know, <laughs> and then God thought about it and, you know, he repented like, hey, you know, what? Uh, hey, yeah, the people will actually think, you know, I'd, I'll lose my glory from the, from the, all these pagans, you know, so now there's, guys, this is very key. God, I've already mentioned this, I won't even, I won't even go deeper into it, but guys, God cares about how the people, how the sinners, how the demons, how the devils, think about him. If you are a child of God, why he's trying to make you holy as he is holy is because you are a reflection of him. When people see, see you, they're supposed to see God. They're supposed to see the way God does things. You're supposed to be distinctively different from everybody else. The way you dress, the way you do things, the way you conduct yourself at work. People are supposed to see there's something about that person that is very different, you know, 
you, you shouldn't be easily approached like everybody will be be bribed easily or anything. People should think twice. They should fear you, you know, before they do things because God is holy. So He wants, He loves that, and He wants the people outside. So remember, holiness, holiness, guys. I also thought about this. Holiness, it doesn't have to do with just you. It has to do with the people, the sinners, the people outside. They are supposed to see you or, or representing God as different, you know. So it's not just about you. So it's supposed to be distinctly different. So now God uh, 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 is ego, you know, uh, with what Moses have actually uh, worked on. You remember he's king and that, that's how you, you speak to king. So it worked, you know, and um, uh, 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 God, you'll see uh, throughout the scriptures as well that, you know, God cares about his name, you know, what people say about his name, you know, and, and playing that about playing the, playing with his ego, it's also a good thing because remember God is king. In fact, you know, at me, me these days, hey, for, for months now, you know, I pray ever since I, uh, we did the book of Revelation, I realized you hey, God is king. And he's in charge of everything. He controls even the devil and the demons and nothing happens without. So I approach him when something happens. I no longer pray like how I used to, I used to pray well, casting demons and whatever and praying, oh Lord. No, I approach him as a king knowing that God can just say a word, he's king, he controls everything and nobody can do anything that did not go through. And Job, the book of Job also helped us that even Satan has to go there to God. So it's, it's amazing. So me, uh, now, I also play on God's ego, you know. You know, if my wife is sending me divorce um, papers, I don't go and cast demons and find demons and fight or, 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 or fasting, so those funny, crazy things and foolish things that, uh, you know, those or other foolish, um, charismatic behaviors, you know, of ignorance because people really don't they don't read the bible they don't know how how god uh, operates and me i play on god's on god's ego now you know uh so i will just go and say look what will people say <laughs> because now look i'm here i'm doing your work people are seeing me as people that do the, i mean they see me as a minister of your word now if you ask your children who, uh, you know, what will people say when we suffer the same consequences, you know, as we are the righteous, we're doing what is right. And then the next thing, um, and that thing, and the next thing, I mean, we are, we are following the commandments about marriage, you know, but then we still suffer the same consequences as the evil people who are committing adultery, who are abusing their wives, who are doing all these things, and you still suffer the same consequences, you know. What will people say? Amen, that's a prayer. You know, it's up to God, you know. <laughs> He's gonna do whatever he has to do, but, you know, when you pray, when you talk to God, you must approach him in the understanding of, he, of who he is. You know, you want answers, you wonder why some prayers are not being answered, it's because you, you are actually not praying to God according to who he is. Guys, try it, play on his ego. I've done it a few times. It always works, you know, it always works. I, I, you know, some other things because of time I can't even go into. But it worked for God. And because God is righteous, uh, he said that he's gonna save Caleb and Joshua because of their faith. And then he's going, he's also going to save the children. And then all these complainers, he's going to kill them again. Why? Because God is righteous. He always rewards the righteous. And what does he do? He's righteous. He always rewards the righteous. And Maria, Tanta? Punishes the wicked. Yes, and punish the wicked. So, so they have to be punished. You, you notice that the wickedness will not go unpunished, but God also shows his grace because he did not wipe everybody else. So we must balance all of these things. You know, uh, we've been seeing this thing throughout, throughout since Genesis. So 
because they have to be punished, he said that, you know what, they are not going to enter the promised land. They are going to die. So he's going to make them even go and be killed. So he allows the Amalekites and the Canaanites, they come and they defeat them and they kill them. So, you know, why? Because God is righteous. He will not let unrighteousness go. In chapter 15, <laughs> drama continues. But before that, you know, what he first gives again, I told you, commandments of sacrifices and holiness, they all keep coming again and again and again. You know, Sabbath, you know, uh, actually the, the story of the Sabbath, actually it happens in chapter 15, guys, sorry, I made an error of that man who was carrying uh, sticks, you know, uh, so it happens here. Uh, you know, but then God, why God is punishing that guy? Because he's righteous. If you do wickedness, if God is, is if God is just, all evil must be punished and all uh, good works must be uh, rewarded. So now, uh, again, because God is gracious, even for this man, after doing this thing to this man, who must have just been collecting because he forgot that it was Sabbath, so he might have been collecting those sticks. So God decided to, to be gracious and do something that will actually remind them, you know, so that they don't make that mistake again. When I was young, my mother actually, uh, not when I was young, I was already even in varsity. I used to lose keys. I used to lose phones. My phone, uh, my phone will never go three months. You know, I will always be losing phones. So my mother actually came up with, the, with an idea and said, look, uh, tie this thing here. So those people who know me, you'll see me all the time. I'll be having keys. Wait, where are my keys? Uh, I've already put them. Oh, I put them far. But you'll see them. They're usually here on my neck. You know, it's something that I've learned ever since then. And ever since then, I haven't lost phones. I haven't lost even the phone. Had that thing, I used to put it here. So this is what God is doing because God is loving and is gracious to His children. You know, those are his qualities along with righteousness. So he decides that, you know what, uh, he's actually going to make them attach uh, tassels on their corners, on the corners of their garments to help them remember all of these holy things that they need to keep. God is actually very wonderful. Chapter 16, drama begins. You know what, this man called Korah and his allies and 250 chiefs and many people, they start... They start bringing democracy. They say, no, who's this Moses and who's this Aaron? Who chose you? We never elected you to be our leader. Even us, we are children of God, man. We are, hey, who do you think you are? You know, and then, you know, Moses stood his ground and he challenged them. He said, look, we'll do an experiment to prove who's holy and who's not. And of course, Moses wins. And God opens the ground and he sends this Korah guy and all these people down to hell alive. <laughs> God didn't even wait for them to, uh, to die first. He just opens the ground and then, and then they die. And then to make sure that they understand that, look, uh, Aaron is also uh, chosen by God. You know, yes, they're coming from the same family. So it looks like it's nepotism. You know, but if God has chosen and chosen, so God actually, Moses takes, calls all of the leaders of this who think that they're supposed to be leaders for, for that position. They bring their staffs and, you know, at, along with, with um, oh, oh, guys, sorry, I didn't read that scripture. You know, so this is the scripture when they were saying, when they were challenging Moses and they were saying, you've gone too far. We've all... Uh, for all in the congregation are holy, you know. We are all children of God, we are holy. Every one of them, and the Lord is among them. And why then do you exalt yourself above us? So they were challenging, and it still happens. You know, guys, we are all children of God, but if someone has been given a special function and or some authorities, you know, that's why we must submit under the pastors. And I keep saying, you know, I'd go to church, don't do these rebellious things. You know, we are all equal children of God and nobody is to be called father or spiritual father or spiritual mother. That's, you refuse that, it's nonsense. But they still, 
uh, spiritual leadership, you know, everything, you know, we still, all of us, we still need to submit under the, under the pastors, you know, and that's honoring God. If God, some of them, they're out of order. Even some of these charlatans, you must be careful even when you criticize them, because some of them, they are, they are not actually uh, false prophets. You know, some of them started off well, they're anointed of God, uh, but then they go out of the way because they love money or whatever, you know, but be careful because same thing happened in with uh, Saul. Saul was anointed, but God started hating him and, you know, he was doomed to hell. But David still recognized that, hey, this guy is actually the anointed of God. So he didn't mess up with him. So we need to be careful. So even the ones that we criticize, we need to be to be careful. So it was a good lesson for me as well because I'm, I'm a very big critic. You know, uh, because there's also room we are also I, we have to balance because in the New Testament we are actually told to actually call these people out and correct them, and but you must just be careful on how we do things, especially when it comes to the elders. Uh, now, uh, even for Aaron, he made sure that he does an experiment and uh, of the staffs and where. Uh, Aaron's staff budded, and then it was a sign for all these people who were challenging Aaron's authority, and so that Aaron is actually chosen by God. So, uh, again, chapter 19, you know, okay, chapter 18, there's those things again, the priests, you know, what are their duties, what are they supposed to do? Uh, consecration, I told you it's going to keep coming, coming, coming again. It's chapter 19, same thing, God gives ceremonial law, how to live, how to be cleansed of the sins. We shall see this over and over. Since Exodus, everywhere, we just stop. God is giving laws, sacrifices, what, what, because you need to be kept holy in your daily life. So imagine now when we've got Jesus who just did all of those things once and for all for us. We are supposed to be doing all these things, guys. You know, so when you read this thing, you, you know what? You, you actually worship Jesus for what he has done. You know, we thank you, Yeshua, for all of this. So now in chapter 20, uh, oh, yes, in 18, actually, why am I going? Chapter 18, the drama, another drama comes in. In fact, yeah, chapter 18 has got many dramas. You know, it starts in with Miriam dying. And no, there's no explanation how she died and why she died, you know. And after that, people start complaining, hey, they want the water, saying Moses, uh, Moses and God brought them to the wilderness to die and kill them. You know, it was better in Egypt. Uh, let me see the time. Yeah, it was better in Egypt. And this, of course, made God angry, you know, uh, but God is still holy. Moses got too angry. And God told him, go and speak to the rock so that water can come in because these people are complaining they want water. But Moses was too angry. He goes there and he strikes the rock. You know the story. Instead of speaking to it, and then what happens? God decides, you know what? Moses, for this sin that you've just done, you will not enter the promised land. You know, so guys, there's a strict order. It's a strict standard for God's people. Uh, and, you know, uh, they are supposed to, you know, when, when, when you uh, guys don't try to be a pastor, you know, don't wish to be a pastor because as James said, you know, stay away from that because there is actually a strict standard of how to live now. When you see all these people doing all of these funny things, going to the news and what, 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 God hates that. God would rather have no pastor than to have a pastor who's going to misrepresent him and, and have people talk bad about him. So Moses does not speak to the rock, so he strikes it. And God says, you did not represent me well to the people because people are supposed to see you as the leader and you know the congregation, they're supposed to, to, to move. So they're supposed to see God in you and you're supposed to reflect uh, God to them, and they are supposed to reflect God to the to the people. So, because you have done this, you have not represented God well by your behavior. You will not enter, you know, 
So, so yeah, guys, um, now it is time to move. There is another drama now. Uh, they need to move past to go to the promised land, but they need to go through Edom. But the Edomites, they refuse for them to pass, to pass through their land. Uh, do you remember who the Edomites are? Um, who's there? Yes. <laughs> Smangele, yes. Who are the Edomites? Yeah, Esau's descendants. Yes, yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Yes, they are Esau's uh, descendants, and Esau and Jacob, uh, or Israel, they are brothers. So, so we are going to learn more about them also later on, because for this thing of refusing them to pass, God is going to punish them. I think the book of Amos it's even about that. So God is still going to punish them. Uh, for what they've done. So now, so you will notice that um, uh, before now, because now they were, they were here at Kadesh. So now instead of passing through the land of Edomites going there, they were refused. Now they're going to go this way, you know. So now an interesting drama happens when they have to go to uh, when they arrive at the Mount Hall. Oh, I don't know how to pronounce that one. Uh, but at the Mount, hey, why are these chapters not? Oh, sorry guys, something is not right with these notes. Uh, we are supposed to be in chapter 20. Uh, how are we doing with time then? It's 11 past. Oh, okay. We're past still, seven. Okay, we still got that 20 minutes. All right. Um, um, yeah. Oh, yes. At the Mount of Hor, that's where uh, another tragic... Remember, Miriam is dead now, eh? So what happens is that God uh, actually, they get to, God actually says to Moses, take Aaron and his son, go up the Mount of Hor, remove his clothes, put on his son, and then Moses and his son comes back. Aaron is dead. And, you know, uh, it's quite a very funny story. But let me just quickly, because now if it's that time, we need to quickly move all these other chapters. I'm just going to mention them. Uh, Israel. Now, no, no, no. This one is a big one as well. So now they need to come to pass as well to in the land of, of Moab. Now, uh, now the king of Moab uh, decides, you know what? I, I don't want these people to pass through this land. Uh, they're scaring me. Uh, and then he hires this guy called Balaam, who was a, a, a diviner, you know, to curse these people. But, you know, these are God's <laughs> blessed people. So each time when he tries to curse, to, to bless them, he actually blessed them, you know. So three times he tries to curse these people. <laughs> they, uh, they actually uh, get blessed. So this is one of, of, of the most interesting uh, chapters as well. But the one that, the part that I really want to get to because now we no longer have the time. It's chapter, uh, you know what? Let me just go to it. The story of the bronze. Again, these people, they misbehave and God decides, you know what? I'm going to send poisonous snakes. Uh, to destroy them. And then what does God do? God sends poisonous snakes and then these people are being eaten. Because remember, he wants to make sure that everybody who was over 40 uh, and all those complainers, they die. Uh, that's another thing that is delaying why they're going to take even longer to get to uh, 
uh, to Canaan. First, it was because they couldn't go through the land of the of the Philistines, but also God is making sure that everybody was 40 and older that did not believe, except for Canaan, uh, sorry, except for Caleb and Joshua, they die in the desert. So they still misbehave. And God sends poisonous snakes, and poisonous snakes are actually killing them. And then God says to Moses, make a bronze snake and uh, to show his grace, whoever looks at that snake uh, will live. You know, so people actually, so it does not stop the poisonous, poisonous snakes. Uh, but whoever, when beaten by the poisonous snakes, when they look at this uh, bronze or, or gold snake uh, or copper, it's, yeah. Whoever looks at it, uh, actually, the poison does not kill them. So again, uh, I'm rushing so that we get to uh, John 3.16. Remember, I said that you cannot understand John 3.16 until, uh, until you read the book of Numbers. So now I want to... Uh, I want us to go to, oh my God. Are you guys still there? Hello? Yes, yes, we're still yes, there. yes, we are. Oh, I've got this Zoom yes. thing popping out saying join the meeting and I'm thinking, oh my God, I've been speaking alone all this time. Uh, the thing is now I'm not able to remove uh, the sharing because I wanted to share with you. Um, can somebody just open John 3 because now uh, my screen is damaged and I'm not able to. Oh, there it is. Can somebody open John 3? Oh, Smangela, do you have a Bible? Okay, let me let me share it from this here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me let me which, which, which on, the, on, on the screen so you, you can read for us then. Uh, let me uh, see the share button if I can find it. Uh, share screen. Uh, I hope it's this one here. Yeah. Uh, can you see ESOD? Can you see the ESOD, the Bible? Yeah, I can see it. We're still on numbers, though. Okay, yeah. So I'm just going to go straight to Exodus 13 so that we close with it. Hey, listen to me. I'm saying Exodus 13. Oh, John 3. So because that's the thing with... Um, okay, let's, let's just read it. Uh, um, remember, context, to get context, you can't just go there. So let's just go from the first one. Okay. Now there was a man. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. You know that you are a teacher. We know that you are a teacher come from God, who comes from God. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That is which is born of the flesh is, is flesh, and that, is, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive testimony. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? 
No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So I continue. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. For God so loved the world. And that pose. For God so loved the world. And that mm -hmm. post, you have actually killed it. So you need to go back to 14. <laughs> so where do I start? 14. Okay. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the, in the name, of the, in the name of, the, of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light, the light come into the world and people, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works um, were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Yeah, so you see now, I mean, you know, let's, let's take this back into, 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 into context. You know, always read at least verses before and verses after. So this is, again, these people, they put... You know, they don't only put chapters and verses, they go and mess around and they put these things, I don't know, they put these titles. You know, these things are not supposed to be in the Bible. You know, don't put, don't add into the word of God. Because now this was a, this is a continuation of what, of what 15 was saying. Because this form, you know, it's explaining, it's explaining what has just been said there, you know. It's saying, you know what, Moses has lifted uh, the serpent from the wilderness and the same way the son of man must be lifted up so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life for God so loved the world. For, for that, that for it's actually connecting these two. So now what does it mean? Who is John writing to? Who is John writing to? Okay. Uh, who are those people that were eaten by, by the snakes and they looked at the serpent in the wilderness? Israelites. So who are the... Who, okay, so now here, yeah, who is John writing to? The church. To the Jews. Thank you. Yes, you are both right. And I'm glad that you both said different things, but it's a combination of those two, you know. Uh, but it's not, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm not, it's Matthew who's writing um, directly to the Jews. But John is writing to the Christians uh, who are facing uh, Gnosticism. So now, you know, this year, it's not like Mark and Luke, you know, uh, this year, it's written to the Christians. There's no message here for the world. It's not talking to the world and saying, look, God has loved you. And you, know, you, know, you cut it and you just go and take this thing, God loved the world. And it, it, it's not. This message is for the children of God. And that serpent there, who was it biting? The children of God. Are you with me? <laughs> I yes. know I'm starting to stretch. Amen. I know I'm stretching yes. my mind a little bit. You know, so now you must understand that now this is about behavior. What did those people do when they were in the wilderness? God's children, they're misbehaving. They are rebelling. They are doing all these unholy things and God is punishing them. Remember, this thing is going to happen throughout the whole scripture and I know this hyper grace where they've taught us that when you're a child of God, uh, you are saved 
by just re receiving so-called receiving Jesus and you know what but almost the whole Bible the whole New Testament and all of Jesus parables they're telling us he's telling us which of the children of God are going to go to hell and which of the children of God are going to go to heaven you're going to see it and we're going to deal with Matthew and whatever all the, the parables of the kingdom of God they're always about which children of God are going to go to hell and which children of God so not all of us well, children of God. yeah just to just to go back to the wilderness does it mean by obviously the serpent that um, Moses had built the children of God that were written near the ones that were rebellious so them looking at the bronze um, statute meant they, in a way, had painted the leaf that by them looking at it, it would heal them. Is that what it means? The similarities that uh, are you believing in Christ, you are cleansed in a way. Yes, it shows. Yes. Okay, I'm going to allow you also to to ask questions, even even from from here. This is my last statement actually, but let me try also to to explain it even 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 further. Because what I'm saying here is, look, uh, these are the children of God and they're misbehaving. And we know even the New Testament that if you misbehave, you know what? Not all children of God are going to go to heaven or, or to enter the kingdom of God. We see it. Uh, we've done the book of Revelation. We've quoted too much and we've seen many children of God. Even when we start from the book, from the first chapters of the book, Jesus is talking to the church and is telling them, the ones that is going to write off the blood of the book of life and the churches that is saying that, look, I like this about you, but I've got this thing against you. If you don't repent, you know, uh, but if you, if you repent, you're going to go into the kingdom of God. So now these are the people who are unrepented and those who are repenting by looking at, the, at, at Jesus, uh, uh, they will be saved. So this is a message to the church. It is not the message to the world. It's not the message about how God uh, is, is, is going to save the world. Hey, you know, this is a message that, you know, uh, uh, that it, it, uh, remember now there's a person here that they're speaking to from the beginning then. It's, uh, it's a Pharisee, it's a Nicodemus, you know, the ruler of the Jews, you know. And it's a person that he himself does not even understand how a person uh, can be born again. And all these things, remember, it's, in the, it's still in that context where Jesus is trying to explain to him how, how people enter the kingdom of God. They need to be born again. You are children of God. You are Jews. You are a Pharisee. You are rebels. You are, you know what, you deserve to, to be eaten in hell by these poisonous snakes. But because God is good, he has actually raised his son so that you, Pharisees, and all these Jewish people and all these children of God that are rebellious, you can look and just believe in Christ and you will be saved. That is the message. So, yeah. Uh, I hope you get it. So, any questions? Uh, I'm looking at the time. That's why I'm, yeah, I have to stop. So, any questions? or comments on the book of Numbers. Some other things, the last few, uh, we're going to actually, we're going to discuss it maybe next week when we, when we enter. I mean, when we go to Deuteronomy. Sorry guys, I haven't even slept well. I'm writing exams even tomorrow. I'm doing many- Oh, other. Oscar. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that. just a comment. Um, I'm amazed by by uh, verse 13 when it says, no one has ascended into heaven. Um, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who came from heaven. Mm. Um, it just brought to my mind when I think of death and where people go after death. And some people believe that they're going into heaven um, up there. So it just brought back this memory that no one will go into heaven where God is, mm. except Jesus himself. Yes, but here I think you are speaking about uh, 
uh, the and you are very right. We've actually talked about about it uh, in the revel in the eschatological studies of of revelation. Because we've been taught too many times that when people die, they go to heaven, but people actually go down here. Uh, and this is one of the of the of the uh, verses that we've read, because when everybody else who have ever died, they've went down here on earth. They are there in a place called paradise or Eden. Eden, that very same Eden is taken down here on earth, uh, or Abraham's bosom. And that's where the righteous are, the ones that are not righteous. They go to a place of torment. And this whole area underneath the earth is called Sheol or Hades in Greek. Uh, but then there will be a time in, in, the, in the future where in the last great tribulation where people are going to be killed here and they will appear before the throne of God in heaven. Uh, so I think that's what also makes people think or it's, you know, what we all die and we go to heaven. But when Jesus comes, we, there's going to be what we call, what we have called uh, the rapture. So everybody that is down there is going to be raised because they are down there. So only Christ died and he was raised and he went up there because he actually came from there. So nobody else goes there. So you're right, yeah. Uh, any comment on the book of Numbers and all its dramas? Yeah, it's actually such an interesting book, Oscar. Yeah. Um, I think initially when I read it, I got so bored with the different names and the descendants, and yo, oh, I, I, I was oh, like, yeah. this is start from chapter one. That's the problem. Can't it? It's pegged. I with got it. bored. <laughs> I left it. I left it. I just couldn't read it. I found I found it so boring. So all of that you are um, teaching today is actually quite interesting. So it makes me want to go back and read because I honestly thought it was boring. Yeah, same, same year. I actually thought uh, Leviticus was boring because it's situated in, in one place and I wanted the drama. I mean, I wanted the action. So the yeah. action actually starts here in this book. But if you, if you because it starts with the numberings and the people, yeah, it makes you think, ah, this is boring. But when you go to chapter two, hey, the drama starts. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for sharing. I, I'm actually going to go and read it. Yeah. And guys, you know, maybe my last remark, guys, remember the main purpose of me, of, of these classes, you know, this, these are overviews. If you go deep into this, oh, you're going to get too much. So the, the main purpose of these classes is to encourage you so that when you go exactly this feeling that you're feeling um, uh, smangled, so that you feel like, yo, I want to go and read this. This is interesting. You know, and then when you go and read it, now you even got, uh, you even have more, uh, you even have more uh, understanding. And yeah, so it's an overview. Thank you, Smangel. Uh, anybody else? Uh, the time now, it's, it's exactly, uh, uh, Nineteen thirty-two. So I know I was a few minutes late, but I think we still finished on time. Uh, so uh, I don't know if anybody else has got any more comments. Or uh, we. I have a question. Yes. A quick question. Yes. So just um, for my sake, unfortunately, while I'm listening, I was cooking as well so i've just i've missed quite a few things but i just have i just want to hear like what is the main purpose of numbers because like um whoever was talking before me said i also found it like an extremely boring book but now you've brought out all these things that are so amazing but what is its, its purpose in the bible thank you for, for thank you for that question you know it is a very important question guys when you when you have to read the bible our problem, you know, as guys, I, I, you must keep understanding this. We are Greek, you know, we are Westernized. We are, we are, our education and everything is Greek. So it is very hard to read uh, Jewish text. You know, the Jewish text is very important. So when you read the Bible, what I'm trying to do for you guys 
It's also to help you read it through a mind of a Jew. All these things when I'm speaking about the laws and everything, you know, you, you need to see them. Once you see the scriptures in the mind, in the uh, in the way of the Jew, you are able to see it and understand it differently. And you're going to see all these errors, how we're reading the Bible, because we're reading it like white people or the Western people or the Greeks. So now this is where the problem is. In our Western world of the Greeks and the, and the, and, and the Western people, we when you write a book, a book has got a topic. You see that thing I was showing in the scripture, they added topics. Bible is not supposed to have topics. Bible is read as a whole, you know, as a whole book. The message is in the whole books. Otherwise, these things, they are misleading. And please don't go with those things of titles and, and even verses. They are also misleading. So now they don't write, the Jews, they don't write uh, to say, okay, this book, the purpose of this book, it's this, you know. And that is how... We, 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 we get messed up because as we're looking at, uh, and I, me as well, when I, when I was teaching, I nearly made those mistakes because I used to do this thing of purpose of the book and it is very false. It's, uh, not very false, but it's not how it is written. How the book is written, the whole Bible is a collection. The Bible means library and it's a collection of books. It actually means books. And all these books, they're about one message and they just, they just keep going around the message. It's not going somewhere or this book, this one is about, uh, this is why topical messages are very dangerous. You know, you can't start a, a message and say, uh, today we're speaking about uh, faith that moves mountains or we're talking about breakthrough. You know, Bible's not written like that. We don't have messages like that, you know. The Bible is about the kingdom of God. It's about God. It's about, like I told you even in the beginning, it's about establishing God, trying to establish uh, his kingdom here and the problems that are set and actually how this problem is going to be solved. And through Christ, that's, that's the main uh, problem solver. I forgot even to mention, even when that guy, Balaam, was supposed to curse the Jews, he actually had somewhere even prophesied that there's going to be a king uh, out of these people, you know, who's going to be, you know, the Messiah. So, you know, it's about that. It's about Christ. You know, Christ said that this book, the scriptures are about him. So that's why when you're reading it, you're looking for Christ. You're looking to see how God's kingdom is being, it's being established and how things work in God's kingdom. So all these books, they are the same. You know, they go around that idea. So that's why you see holiness in Exodus. They keep doing these sacrifices, the Levites, priests, whatever, Levites, book of Leviticus, same thing. Uh, you come to Deuteronomy, same thing. You're going to see the same thing in Deuteronomy, sorry. And then the in Numbers, it's the same thing. But you know what? There's also a story that is moving, uh, you know, uh, and there's also pictures and shadows of Christ because it's about Christ. So that's how you read the scriptures. You know, you're looking for Christ, you're looking to understand the, the kingdom of God and how things operate in the kingdom. You, you already told me what the kingdom is. You know who the king is. You know um, we are citizens, and then now we have to go according to the rules. So that's why throughout the whole Bible, New and Old Testament is that. So you don't look for, the purpose of this book is to teach people that complaining <laughs> it's wrong you know, or challenging uh, the leadership. No, you're doing topics, you're putting your own things. You know, those are the things that, you know, at, throughout the kingdom of God, we are seeing that there's these issues and God is correcting them and showing them how his ways are, you know. So you can pick up themes. You can actually pick up many things, uh, different things, but you can't say this book was written for that people. When Moses was writing it, when God was telling him what to write, God did not say, this is the purpose of this book. The purpose of the book is the Bible, is to tell us that, look, we are sinners. Uh, we need to enter the kingdom of God. God provided the sacrifice. The Messiah is coming, and we're going to enter that kingdom. Uh, and this is the way to do it. And this is how we're expected to live in that kingdom, holiness and all of those things. Don't read, don't read the Bible like, uh, Western, like a Western book. It is a Jewish book. Uh, did that help? Did I answer?
Yes, you did actually. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can I just make a comment also? I think uh, it, in a way it's a, an interesting question about the purpose um, of the book. But I think also it's it's like a general in the story. It's like having a general. Because if you look at it, for, for a reader like you and me, yeah. uh, why do I care that there were 72,600 uh, of Judah, 56,300 of Levi? or whatever, but uh, this, it's like they were journaling their story of uh, where they came from, what God did, uh, what the rules, like you said, there was some guy that uh, was picking up sticks. I mean, what does that have to do with anything, you'll think, but in, in, in reality, it's the, you can see the application of the law within the journey. So I think it's like a journal extent uh, what writing includes some prophecies uh, and a collection of uh, the rules that that he got and that's my view it's true and and then you, you realize that because history repeats itself it's there to teach us one the same thing about one and the same message you are always going to find the same message in all the books of the bible you know and that's what I love about, you know, Hebrew writing, they just go around the same idea, same idea, many books, next book, the other book, same idea, same idea, same idea. So you can't miss it. How people end up preaching all these other things and they miss the, 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 the main ideas, I don't know. So the, if you want to know the purpose of the book, you must be asking what is the purpose of the Bible? So you're going to find one and the same message. All right. Any more questions, comments? By the way, if you if you're ready to leave, guys, uh, you 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 may also leave uh, while we're taking the last questions. I have a question, Oscar. Yes. I just want to find a way. Do you get all this uh, knowledge information from? <laughs> oh, what do you? Oh, you mean like, how do I study? Yeah. Oh, me, yo. Uh, I study, I use study Bibles. Uh, but, um, you know, I remember I told you guys when we were starting that, you know, never just have a plain Bible. Always have a study Bible. Because the Bible, the, the study Bible right there in the beginning, it's going to tell you, uh, who wrote the book, why are they writing the book. Sometimes it's that thing that you're calling paper. Sometimes when I read that, I realized now, uh, I think, but it actually also gives me more idea uh, of how, uh, of some messages that are in the book, but you have to read. So me, what I do, I still go to all, all the chapters uh, and, and read myself and, you know, as I'm, I mean, I pray about this thing and, you know, because it's also my gift, when I read, I understand, and I write, and I write the notes, I write the notes, I write the notes. Uh, but what I also do, I also check against the other people, you know, because uh, this is not my message. And if I bring a message and somebody else did not get that message, you know, by default, I think it's already a false message, you know, until I find somebody else. So me, I've got my own, uh, favorite uh, uh, ministers and things that I look for. And my, the main one, the main one that I use, it's uh, that I recommend, it's Paulson, David Paulson, you know. So I always check his material. Uh, he wrote a book uh, on, on Old Testament and also on New Testament, each book, each book. So I like his stuff. Uh, yeah. But because this is also my, my calling, you'll find that you know, a lot of things that I pick up, uh, these guys, they never talk about them as well. But, but I look into, I also check the commentaries. You know? So when I look at the commentaries and then I'll say, oh, okay, uh, someone also got it like that. So the commentaries I, I usually use, uh, uh, John Chill. Uh, John Jill is the main one that I use. Uh, and I also use sometimes um, 
uh, what is his name? Albert, Al, uh, let me just look for, uh, for his name. I use John Gill and uh, or Albert Baines sometimes and Joseph Benson. Uh, yeah. So I, I check, I check how other people see certain things. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I do. What I like about most of these guys is that they, are, they study Jewish culture and they, they interpret scriptures from the Jewish point of view and not from our Western point of view. So I always, guys, I always, I'll always encourage you to get a study Bible because study Bibles, you'll get reference because you see this thing. If I if I see a name like what, what you what you notice, if I see a name like uh, Edomite, you know, I'll click on it and then go check on the site. So study Bibles will have on the site. Then they will tell you that Edomites are actually descendants of of Esau, the brother to Jacob, and what, what not. And then, oh, that makes sense. Oh, so they moved right there from the, the Bible said that the Esau moved uh, south or whatever. And then that's why it's situated. That that's why these people are there. See, this kind of a thing. So you get more information in study Bibles. Never, guys, never have a plain Bible. It does not make sense. We are here to, we're supposed to be a Bible schooler as you study the scriptures. You don't read the scriptures. So all that information you can always get from study Bibles. Yeah. yeah. Please get study but Bibles. The, but yeah. study Bibles, those comments are written by a person. Yeah, but Who remember- might be in error? No, not, not, you see, you see, it's like, um, and these are scholars. Uh, errors, errors will be there. Errors will always be there. I've I've seen a lot of errors and some stuff I know what not to take. Why not? But but there's very few errors because scholars are like um, uh, are like the normal scholars. You when you go to varsity and you do a thesis, a project, you know you're doing a, a thesis on. Uh, how electricity works, you know, and it's a it's a it's a project for your for your degree and for your or for your doctorate, you know. So you can't you can't just go and write whatever is coming out of your head, you know. You know mm -hmm. when you're doing this, you take books, you take others, you compare, you know, and you you come up with the with the thing. So it 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 has to be proven beyond doubt. You know, so that's why you will have footnotes because you are saying this one said this, this one said this, and according to this, you know, so you have done your research. It's it's research, you know. So it's hardly so. So you will see the com com commentaries. They'll say, you know, what others say this, you know, it's where they differ with other people. But otherwise, the information is supposed to be the same. If you listen to every teacher, you go now to 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 YouTube, to, to YouTube, and go to the same material that I've been preaching here. And you go to a, to a teacher like Paulson or someone, you find that they're teaching the very same things that I'm teaching. John, you told me about uh, project, what Bible project, project Bible, what? Which one? There's a, a, couple, a few things we've said. Yeah. Project no, Bible. There's some program that you told me about, and I went and I checked it. They also do these things, and they're actually quite good yeah. in summarizing the Bibles and everything. And you know what? They'll do it in like seven minutes, the whole book. And then you check these sort of things, you know, because those are scholars. Yeah. Know, and Can I just say something? Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. If I may just say, uh, I understand where Maureen is coming from. Uh, the issue is, is that uh, the Bible is a spiritual book or has got elements of spirituality in it, but there's a tendency to want to... Uh, uh, you know, spiritualize every aspect of the Bible in terms of it being otherworldly and not within the context of history, geography. The reason why people don't understand the Bible also is because this, this stuff that you teach now about 
uh, they move from this place to this place. This is geography that we can see today. It's on this earth. So, uh, and, and also when you're talking about um, uh, uh, um, things like genealogy, uh, oh, the sorry, historical context in terms of time. Yes. 